First presentation is on cold in place and cold central plant recycling by Steve Cross. Steve is the technical director of ERA and professor at Oklahoma State University. Uh, I'm gonna do a couple of things. I think a lot of y'all have already, I've talked before about cold in place recycling. We have a new web page. So I have a bunch of web shots, but if you guys uh, have computer access and you wanna play around with the website while I'm talking to you, that's fine with me. It's, uh, I'm a college professor. I'm used to do, people doing other things while I lecture. That won't bother me at all. <laughs> the only thing different is I can't give you guys a quiz at the end of the day for my revenge, but uh, but if you go to, if you want to, you can go to www.roadresource.org, and it'll bring it up. But I'm going to go over a couple little things first. I'm sure, y'all have all heard of us by now. But we're the Asphalt Recycling and Reclaiming Association. We're a trade association. We're made up of contractors. We're made up of uh, material suppliers and equipment suppliers and consultants and academians like I was that's interested in in-place recycling. So we cover cold planing, hot in place coal in place, cold central plant, full depth reclamation. And since you use the same equipment for soil and base stabilization as you do for FDR, we kind of kick that in as well as kind of a side. So what I want to do, you really wanted me to talk about cold in place. So I thought I would pick out a couple of things about cold in place recycling. I, I occasionally hear some people say some things about this that are not completely true. So that's what I really wanted to hit on. But project selection is a big deal for cold in place recycling. And really, it works best. And what it was meant for was cracked pavements that are structurally sound and have well draining bases. That's the best place to use it. Can you use it other places? Sure. You know, it may not work quite as well, but that's really what it's for is a structurally sound cracked pavement. But the question is, you know, we can come in. And I can cold and play, cold and cycle replace that. People tell me you can't go all the way down to the aggregate base. I'm like, well, yeah, you can. As long as the aggregate base is sound and will support the equipment, there's plenty of states that take all that have thin asphalt pavements and aggregate bases and take all of it. As long as the base is sound, and that's usually a big question, it can be successfully done. Most places, especially if it's not all that sound, we recommend you leave at least one inch of asphalt on there to help support the equipment. Because the last thing I want is that milling machine is heavy and I don't want it breaking through the pavement on me and getting stuck and having to pull it out. That can be a real issue. The other issue that comes up is can I pick up some of the aggregate base? And the answer is yeah. I got three inches of asphalt and I want to go four inches. I can pick up one inch of asphalt base if it's clean. It's going to take more recycling agent uh, what I can't do is be bumping in and out of 100% wrap and a little bit of aggregate base and coming in and out because I, it's an in-place recycling process. I can't adjust my recycling agent on the fly. So I need a consistent section. I need it to be all in the asphalt or if I'm coming in and picking up some of the aggregate base, a little bit of it's okay. It's going to take more recycling agent, but it needs to be consistent. I can't be jumping in and out because I'll end up with fat spots and lean spots because I can't adjust the thing on the fly. A little bit about the equipment. The original equipment were recycling trains. Uh, so it's a full, width, uh, a full lane width mill, usually 12, 12 and a half foot head. It'll mill one lane in full pass. Uh, that material then comes into a recycling unit. In the old days, these were two separate trains, two separate units. Now they're almost always combined into one. But that millings come over and they go over a scalping screen. We'll scalp off the oversize, run it to a crusher. We'll crush it, run it back through the screen, and then everything that passes the screen goes into a pug mill. Okay? And then we tow behind recycling agent, and there's a water tanker truck you're not seeing as well. So two different pictures of the equipment there, but this is the full unit train. A couple of things about the full unit train, okay? With the full unit train, I can control the top size of the wrap because I have a crushing and screening unit, okay? So you can set it to whatever you want and we can crush it to that. Uh, the other thing about this one is it adds the recycling agent based on the mass of the material entering the pug mill, okay? So it goes in quite accurately. And then the one that really comes up is uh, the type of recycling agent. And I hear occasionally, well, if I use a full unit train, I have to use an emulsion. I can't use foam. That's not true. Okay, I can easily put a different, you have to modify it, but it's a pug mill. And I can put a spray bar in there that will allow me to use foamed asphalt as well. So a full unit train can use either one. And then basically the only other thing you see is a single unit train. There are still one or two two unit trains running around, but they're getting scarce. You probably won't see one. But the single unit trains, 
Uh, it's a milling machine and it's going to mix the recycling agent in the cutting housing. Okay, so there's lots of different uh, configurations of these. The one up on the top has a screed attached to the back. Okay, so it mills up the material, mixes the recycling agent, runs it through a screed. The one I have on the bottom, they just left the uh, conveyor belt on the back of it and it's dropping the material into the hopper of a paver and it's placing it that way. And the third option is like we do on the multi-unit planes, I drop it into a windrow, pick the material up with a windrow elevator, and put it in a paver. Okay, so there's several different options on the single unit. But the big deal with the single unit is it's going to cut it and mix it with the same machine. So the deal with the single unit, how do I control the top size? I can't guarantee you the top size with the single unit. I control it though by cutting in a down cutting mode and watching the forward speed of my machine. The slower I go, the finer the material will be. The faster I go, the coarser it will be. Okay? And then the second thing, it adds the recycling agent volumetrically. So you assume the unit weight of the material, you have a depth of cut, a width of cut, and a forward speed. And the pump's tied to the forward speed of the machine. So you speed up and slow down, it adjusts how much material it's uh, recycling agent it's putting in there. And then the other one we hear all the time is the single unit uses foam, the multi-unit uses emulsion, uh, they can do either one. Okay, the single units have bars in there. If you get a work kit that has a bar, they can do either one. If you get it from Rotec, they can put a bar in there that will do emulsion. Okay, so they can do either one. And then the last one I wanted to talk about real quick was uh, urban versus rural. And typically these were all started out on low volume uh, rural roads. We've done these, you can do them anywhere. So the picture, these two pictures are from uh, the city of Beverly Hills in California, and they cold in place recycled Hollywood Boulevard in Beverly Hills, California. So as the contractor said, when they looked at the cars they had backed up in traffic control, they had three or four cars that were worth more than the train. <laughs> you know, so they were a little worried about having to do some things, but had no problem. It's just traffic control. Uh, the other thing I'll say, although this is not an FDR, uh, convention or, or meeting. Los Angeles County does FDR all the time on their city streets. So, can, you know, yeah, urban's a little, e uh, rural's a little easier. You don't have to worry about utilities and all that, but it can be done either place. And the last one that we get a lot of, uh, there's a lot of interest is cold central plant recycling. So with cold central plant, there's some places that have just stockpiles of wrap all over the place. So I can take if my wrap is in good shape, I mean, the quality of my project is going to be based on the quality of my wrap. If you have a pile that you just thrown a bunch of junk in there, then that's what's going to get coming out. But if you have a nice, good stockpile, you've kept it clean, kept the deleterious materials out of there, I can crush it, I can run it through a pug mill, mix it, add the bituminous recycling agent, I've made a cold mix. Transport it, lay it down, place it just like you would any other mix, compact it, it's going to need a surface course on it. Uh, it's been used, uh, Virginia is the leader in using cold central plant. They put some down on I-81, which was a rural interstate, and then they're widening I-64, rebuilding and widening I-64 in Norfolk, Virginia, and they're using uh, FDR and cold central plant extensively on redoing that. So uh, we've had some really good luck with cold central plant and a lot of uh, interest in it. The other thing we hear occasionally, though, is uh, what's the difference you know there's a, oh, there's a huge difference between cold in place and cold central plant there's really not wrap came from a road you know did you recycle it there or did you haul it put it someplace else and we have several of our contractors uh, especially out west that have done some cold central plant and they just take their train park it next to a pile of wrap and process it through their in-place recycling train or you can buy a pug mill plant and set it up and run it through there it really doesn't make any difference so I thought I'd give you just a little background, uh, dispel a little bit of misinformation I occasionally hear running around. But what I want to do now, but if you want to, go to roadresource.org. And this is a joint venture of ERA, EMA, and ISA. You know, we call ourselves the PPRA, Pavement Preservation and Recycling Alliance. But we got together and put together a new web page. I'm a bit of a pessimist. This, I was really pleased at the way this came out. <laughs> but. Uh, the, what you're seeing right there at the bottom is the uh, opening page screen and I'm going to run you through a little bit of what's in here. 
But I do want to point out this isn't something that we did ourselves. Uh, we had input from over 45 agency and industry leaders when we put together this web page. Uh, they interviewed all kinds of people. We talked to agency level people, pavement managers, DOTs, roadway engineers, and then it went through a technical review. But I will warn you, it's new, it's first out there. It's kind of like a lot of you guys with the DOT, you put out a new spec book and then the first thing you do is put out supplemental specs to correct things. So there's a few little glitches in there. We're, we're working on those. But here we're going to run through here. So way over on the left hand side, there's about us. The next one is the treatment toolbox. And if you click on the treatment toolbox, uh, you'll come up with uh, three main things. One is which treatment is best for my road, the treatment resource center, and find a contractor or supplier. So I'm going to go through the first two. You don't need to look and see where the air contractors are located. But under which treatment is right for my road, uh, we're going to explore by pavement criteria and explore by pavement photos. Okay? And this covers all of the ISA and, and ERA disciplines, not just mine. So if I click on which uh, pavement condition, I come up with a screen like this. We have a pavement section over there. But if you start up at the upper right under pavement condition, you put in your, your, pave, your PCI index. Then you put in your primary distress. And then there's also road type and surface type. And for the era treatments, the road type and the surface type really don't have much of an impact on the selection. For some of the ISA treatments, they do. But if you click on those, uh, it'll click up, it'll highlight over here on the left some, some things that you could use that you might want to take a look at. And then the other one is the photo selector. And so if you, you know, this was one, uh, this was one that honestly needs a little bit of work. It's, it was put together, you know, we got some photos, they're not necessarily the best photos, but a lot of people told us, gee, you know, my road looks like this, what should I do? Well, the only problem with that is what it looks like on the surface doesn't necessarily what, tell you what the problem is down below but it's an idea. Click on one of these uh, photos and if I click on one of those photos it's going to come up and I have some block cracking level C and it tells me uh, my primary distress was longitudinal and transverse cracking, moderate quarter to three quarter inch width and it gives me some possible solutions. Okay, And I will point out that ERA decided to be quite conservative on their possible solutions. I'm not really sure ISA did, <laughs> but, um, but that's another story, but that's fine. But there are some possible solutions there, and then you can click on those and it will give you more information. But it just gives you some general ideas. And again, I will point out, most of y'all are with DOTs, we're what we would consider very sophisticated users. It's not necessarily geared for y'all, okay? But it's there uh, as some information. The next place you can go to under that same heading is there's the Treatment Resource Center. And so if you click on the Treatment Resource Center, it comes up with all of our treatments. So uh, when I'm looking at the screen, I guess you are too, the two columns to the right are the error disciplines. That's the in-place recycling and the base stabilization issues. And if you click on any one of those you want, and we're going to give you some more information. So I clicked on uh, Cold In-Place Recycling. And it comes up with a page, an overview page. It starts with an about section, and it just gives you some general information. But what I want to point out uh, is when you look over here in the blue, there's pages under each one of those things. So, you know, we cover an overview that talks just, you know, an overview of the thing. It talks about process variations, expectations, cost, history, best practices. We have a pre construction section talks about site selection, uh, material selection, talks about all the different materials we might use in these treatments, uh, mixed design information, uh, tells you where you can go for mixed design procedures, so a little bit about the specifications, and then when we come into construction, talks about site preparation, weather requirements, equipment, calibrations, traffic control, yeah, they call it application, that's what I would have just called construction and in quality assurance. So you can click on any of those. Uh, comes up a little bit bigger here, I'm just showing you one. This is cold in place. We think it's really used toward the middle or the bottom of the curve. So a level of CERT PCI of 70 or less, or what we call you know, distress C, D, or F. Gives you just a little bit of general information. Uh, remember, we're a trade association. So we say 20 to 50% less expensive than condition, you know, conventional. Well, yeah, we found 50 one time. <laughs> 
<laughs> so uh, you may not quite get it that way, but we typically see 20 to 30 or more. As you get further out west where we have far haul distances, we tend to see some bigger differences in the in-place versus the conventional. One of the things I like, you can click on here and it talks about expectations. And so we have, you know, you put it down where it really ought to go the best place, average performance, and you put it down as a stop gap, how long will that last? And I want to point out when you look at this, those years look pretty long. We're talking about how long will the cold in place last, not how long will your asphalt overlay you put on top of there. And we've had some agencies that can't tell you how long the cold in place will last because they've never come back and done anything to them. Central Federal Lands is one of those that they've done this extensively. Have they come back and repaired some? Yes, it's always been the overlay. So keep that with a grain of thought. If you read it, it tells you that. But otherwise, uh, you first take a glance at those, it's like, wow. It's like, okay, we're talking about the, you know, how long does the base layer in your asphalt pavement last? Okay, lots of places forever. <laughs> okay, you've never gone down and fixed that. All right, looking at a couple of these others. If you look under inspection, and under inspection, we have all these different headings. So we're talking about what you need to look, what does the inspector need to look at at the mix design, surface preparation, what weather conditions are ideal, what does he need to take a look at with traffic control on some of these processes, they're in place, we're moving down the road, it's a moving traffic control, what the equipment needs to be, workmanship issues to take a look at, how to check application rates, and then we have additional resources which links to uh, troubleshooting guides uh, and some agency specifications. If I look under testing protocols and troubleshooting, when you go to testing protocols, I couldn't put these on a, on a sheet or a screenshot, but they are a series of tables that tell you the recommended pre-construction testing that should have been done for project selection and mixed design, construction testing, and we're generally gearing these toward QC, not QA, but some of these would also be QA, and then post-construction testing. And then when you come down, there's another tab on troubleshooting. You've got some issues with the map. What are you looking at? So under construction section, it tells you what to look at, if you get, what to do if you're seeing a little segregation. Wet and dry spots. With wet and dry spots, you may very well be picking up aggregate base occasionally that you really need to stay out of. Uh, oversized wrap, flushing, spongy mat. Post-construction, if you park a bunch of uh, uh, 18 wheelers that just came off of a high road, high speed road on a fresh CIR mat, they sit there very long, you might dimple a little bit, tell you what to do with that. Running, raveling, surface tolerance issues. Treatment Resource Center is, it's a digital version of the BARM, our basic asphalt recycling manual. However, there is a lot more detail in the BARM than there is in the web page. Okay? But that's basically what it is. So our basic asphalt recycling manual covers our disciplines, coal planning, hot in place, coal recycling, which is CIR, CCPR, and full depth reclamation. And there's chapters on uh, project analysis, mixed design, construction, project specifications. If you need a copy of the BARM, let me know. But what I wanted to show, one of the biggest questions we have is uh, applicability. All right, but we do have a table uh, in the BARM that really runs through and says, hey, this is your distress, this is what, you know, what we can handle and what you might need to do to handle that. So I know you can't read it, I just wanted you to know it's there. We've got one for HIR and FDR. And there's links to this table in the, in the uh, webpage. All right, if you go to the recycling tab on the far right hand side, Click on that, you have why recycling and reclaiming, gives you, talks about uh, just the overview again. There's a structural comparison calculator, era publications and about era. So we have a little structural comparison calculator that says I come in and I, and it's not a structural design and it's using the old 93 ASHTO A coefficients. So you come in and you put in your conventional approach and I'll give you a shot that's a little bit bigger, you can see this a little better, and then you put in your recycling approach and you can, you can compare. You can, can try to come up with the same structural number and see how it costs or look at the same cost and see what benefit in structure you'll get. So I real quick threw in a couple of these and I'll point out it's pre-populated with default numbers. So there are default A coefficients. You can put in whatever A coefficient you want and there are default costs. And I highly recommend if you use it for cost, you put in your own cost. We're a trade association, we can't talk about costs, so we had to give a third party 
to get some cost data for us and come up with quote average cost. But the problem is ERA is not a big organization and we're not equally distributed across the United States. So the average costs probably aren't going to be real applicable to what you have, but you can put in your own numbers. So I had one I just did real close. I was, had an existing pavement. I was going to do a two-inch mill and fill. Came up with the structural number when I got done of 2.08 and the cost of a little over $11. I came in and did a chip seal and a three-inch cold in place recycling. Uh, and I came out with a 2.02 .02 for about 875 a square yard. So for the same structural number, um, cheaper, more cost effective, I'm sorry. And here's one where I tried to match the same cost, but I didn't spend a whole lot of time on it. And I came out with uh, uh, 0.6 higher structural coefficient for another dollar or two a square yard, dollar and a half a square yard. So it's something you can play around with. But again, you can put in, you can adjust all of these numbers. We go to network optimization, and I'm going to go through this quickly because I am not a network optimization guy. I spent my whole career either working for testing labs or uh, in the lab doing mixed designs or out in the field doing construction. I'm not a network optimization guy. But we have several network optimization calculators on here. This is certainly not meant to replace your pavement management system. But we have a life cycle cost calculator, an equivalent annualized cost, a remaining service life calculator, and a cost benefit value. Uh, but we have a life cycle cost calculator. You can put in, you know, your, uh, and we also have these things have life expectancies, but you can put in your own. And you can uh, put in a couple of different options and compare, and it will run it over a life cycle. Then we have another one where we can do equivalent annualized cost. So we compare the cost treatment based on life extension. You can put in several different things and it'll kick up some answers for you. This was the one that I kind of liked. I thought was kind of interesting. Uh, remaining service life. And you can put in part of your system. And if you have a 500 mile, lane mile system, basically if you don't do anything, you lost 500 lane miles per year of life out of the thing. So you can come in and put in a management system. I've got so much money. I want to do a little of this, a little of this, and a little of this, and it will tell you whether your system is gaining life or losing life. That was pretty interesting, but again, I'm not a network optimization guy. So. And then the last one was cost benefit value. So which projects do you know you can, and this one has a, a constraint factor because you can't just simply do some, some roads have higher traffic, you need to do more on this road than others. So it has a few things where you can uh, tweak it a little bit and give you a cost benefit value. What I do want to say, you can come in, you can log in, and you can set up your own account, and it'll take you to a page where you can input your own cost, life extension, A coefficients, et cetera, for all of these different treatments. And then when you come back and log in again, it will still be there. So if you want to use our treatments, our uh, calculators, and use them more than just once, it'd be worthwhile to come in and populate this yourself rather than using ours. And I will tell you, when you start looking at your cost data, you're going to go, well, gee, that's not right for my area, which is the same thing every one of my calculators, my contractors have said, too. And that's the problem with an average cost when you're not uniformly distributed across the country. Other resources, then, just to finish up. ERA has written a series of best practice guidelines for our uh, treatments. So we have a 100 series, and these are construction best practice guidelines. They're written in uh, suggested specification languages. AASHTO has asked us to put together uh, construction best practice documents, and we think we can take our 100 and 300 series and put those into AASHTO. We're going to submit one on cold in place recycling and see how it goes. But these are written in suggested specification language for you. Then we have a 200 series, which is project sampling and mixed design guidelines. We have submitted, uh, we submitted to AASHTO a couple of years ago our coal recycle emulsion mixed design procedure to AASHTO, and they've adopted it as a, a provisional specification. So it's out there, they're MP31 and PP86, I believe. Uh, so they're out there if you want them. We just submitted an FDR with emulsion. Uh, so it's going through the review process. And again, that came straight out of our mixed design procedures. So uh, the reason I'm telling you that is I think our mixed design procedures that we came up with are, are reasonable. They seem to work. And then we have a 300 series, which is QC guidelines. So recommended quality control checks, 
and recommended uh, remediation actions. And they have user notes in there that explain what we were talking about, why we went one way or another. Well, there it is right there. I meant to take that other slide out. Got a good memory, though. I got the PP86 and the MP31 right. All right, Jason's here. He helped tremendously on this, but, and so did Tim Aschenbrenner, but we got an FHWA tech brief on uh, project selection guidelines for cold in place and cold central plant through. It came out last year. Uh, you can find this on the web. It's HIF 17-042. And then we developed a few years ago uh, pocket guidelines. These are really good for inspectors. I know that uh, they talked about this yesterday. They're going to update these, maybe put some videos in them and get them on the web. But we have three of these. We have them for hot in place, cold in place, and full depth reclamation. So those are available. Uh, so they're available on the road resource web page as well, but I'll show you a couple other ways to get them. And then this is one I want to spend a minute on. We put together uh, several years ago through the Tra Transportation Curriculum Coordination Council, or TC3, a series of web-based inspector training classes. And AIR recommends before you do a project, especially if you're not real familiar with it or some of the people working on it are not real familiar with it that you do a just-in-time training and these actually work really well for just-in-time training they are geared toward inspectors so we put together three of them you have the course numbers there but HIR is 2590 CIR is 2509 and FDR is 2539 these are hosted by AASHTO they should be free at checkout at one time. I think now they come up free, but at one time they came up with an astronomical cost and we complained and were able to get those taken off and for free since they didn't, they didn't pay to develop them. But they're free at checkout. They take you anywhere from an hour to three hours to get through them. But they cover just an overview of what the process is. They talk about pre-production pre activities full production activities and post construction activities and they're geared for inspection. So we've been real pleased with the way these come, have come out. Uh, and like I said, if you have you know, uh, testing lab agencies that are coming and inspecting it or new inspectors to this, this would be a good place to get some training. Where else can you find these? Well, we are transitioning our www.era.org to a member web page and the road resource is going to be the one for the general public. But right now, if you want the guidelines, uh, information like that, this is probably the best place to go. So go to era.org and then go down to the little folder that says resource and training and you click on that and it will come up with some more folders. So you can find our guidelines, the uh, links to the uh, training classes that are out there, the pocket guides and some papers and news archive newsletter. But I'll answer or take any questions that you might have on a wide variety of topics if you want. That was just kind of a general overview. So. Where would be the best place to direct my agency personnel as far as ADT and traffic levels or truck levels for different wearing courses on top of the cold in place? No, that's, I mean, that's, that's always an issue. And really, we kind of come back to uh, you, you just do a thickness, you know, an overlay thickness design. That's one of the things we say is traffic really isn't an issue as long as you adequately design the thing. Now, one thing I'll point out, especially with cold in place, you're going to be trafficking that road a little while before you get the overlay on it. And so when we have someone that's going to, you know, it's going to be a heavy traffic pavement and you're going to run the traffic on it, we want you to pay real close attention in the mix. Design. Adding something that will kick it off with a little bit more initial strength is not a bad idea. So we kind of encourage the use of lime or cement if you're going to put high traffic on it. The only thing I'll warn you, and Dave Jones will talk about that a little bit, I don't want you turning a flexible system into a semi-rigid system. So we want to watch how much cement you put in there. Uh, the mixed designs don't cover that. You know, they, whatever they look at, the more cement you, you put in there, the better things look, but you're going to start cracking things up. So nobody wants to come back through and run fatigue testing to show that in a mixed design. But right now, we tend to recommend that you keep the residual, the ratio of the residual asphalt to the cement somewhere at least two and a half to three to one. You're kind of limiting your cement really to no more than one percent. And again, that's to prevent brittle behavior, but that cement will give you some initial, uh, it'll kick off that emulsion quicker, let it set up, give you some better initial strength. But if you get it too high, it's gonna crack up on you. 
related question, you mentioned structural numbers, so are you actually calculating the structural number of the CIR material, FWD testing, or is such a range then are you doing structural design for that surface layer? Okay, structural layer coefficient. We give a range, okay, and leave it up to you. For CIR, we see most people using somewhere between 0.3 and 0.35. I know a couple of agencies in Ontario does a lot of this. They use 0.35 to 0.38. But, you know, somewhere between 0.3 to 0.35, when you get into FDR, we back that off a little bit, um, 0.25 to 0.3 for emulsions. I get real leery when people want to use uh, A coefficients for FDR with cement. It's just not meant for that. But we have default values in here. I think on the calculator, I, use, I believe it's using 0.34 for CIR, 0.44 for hot mix. But you can, you can, it doesn't show it, but when it comes up, there's a tab. It's not showing it, but when it comes up right here and right here, if you put a, your pointer over that, tabs will come up and you can run those up and down and use whatever you want. So now you show the chip seal as an, uh, as an option. Yes. Is, is that happening? I've heard of double chip seals over CAR. Well, Are people actually doing that? In my part of the country, yes. I'm from Oklahoma. We hadn't had snow in five or six years. Parts of the country, Southern California, they'll put a single chip seal on there. Well, I mean, one of the keys, though, to, you know, coal in place, it goes down with high air voids, okay? So it needs to be protected. So whatever you put down on, I mean, I, Generally, we don't recommend a single chip seal in an area where you have snow plows. But yeah, it's a good point. But up here, probably not. But down in my area in California, yeah. Crushing to size after the addition of oil? No, it's crushed before. Well, not always, depending on how the contractor sets up the train. So we've seen it okay. after. So what do you think about that? Uh, no, I wouldn't do it. I'm not aware of a train that crushes afterwards. All I've seen, they crush before. Talking to the contractor, he thought that uh, overall the, the operation, uh, picking it up, uh, transferring it to the uh, paper, did enough uh, mixing of it that it had no appreciable difference whether he did it before or after. You can, you can tell what I thought about that. <laughs> okay. So is it, is, do you have... Any studies on this? No, I have no studies. This is the first I've heard of this. Okay. okay. I mean, but, you know, the way, I mean, in the single unit train, it's working in a, a down cutting mode. It's cutting the stuff. It's shooting the stuff in behind it where it's already been crushed. I mean, it may inside the single unit bust it up a little bit more, but it's basically coating it all in there while it's crushing, not after. And in the, the multi-unit train, it's got to go through through the crushing and screening unit before it goes into the puck room. Thank you, guys. The preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.